Hello and welcome to week three of Mind, Brain and Body. In this third week, we will explore the emergence of the medical profession in Britain during the late 18th and first half of the 19th centuries. Now, our exploration centres on a case study, and this is the charge of libel that was brought against one Thomas Wackley, who lived between 1795 and 1862. Wackley was a medical reformer and journalist. Wackley was typical also of an increasing number of young men of middle class origins who aspired to careers in medicine in the early 19th century. Wackley was, in terms of family background, one of 11 children. He was the son of a farmer. The family had prospered by the acquisition of fertile agricultural land and the application of new agricultural techniques in the southwest English county of Devon. After schooling, like many young men of his social class at a local grammar school, he was to pursue a medical career by what was the commonest route of entry at that time, and this was apprenticeship to an established local medical practitioner. And most of these local medical practitioners were actually trained in surgery. Uh, they weren't physicians with a university background in most cases. Now, in Walkley's case, he was actually first apprenticed at the age of 15 to an apothecary in Taunton, which was the county town, and still is, of Somerset. And then he served an apprenticeship with several surgeons. And this was followed by further medical studies at London hospitals, combined with attending one of the number of private anatomy schools that then existed in the capital and other British metropolitan centres. Sometimes these, you'll find these in our literature, you'll find these private anatomy schools referred to as extramural schools. And what this means, extramural outside the walls, is that these private anatomy schools are catering for medical education uh, outside of the university. Indeed, in many instances, it's the case, as we will see in a, a couple of weeks' time, that these uh, extramural schools uh, centred on anatomy teaching and were extremely popular with students, largely because these uh, schools specialised in dissection and in the best schools or the ones that were regarded as the best schools at that time uh, students were able to take some part in the dissection of corpses themselves and by this way uh, they gained a practical instruction in the structures of the human body. Now very likely with his family's financial assistance Walkley was able during his studies at the, at both at St Thomas's and St Guy's hospitals in London, to buy a place as an assistant to one of its leading surgeons. Now this would have considerably helped him in setting up a private practice in London, most likely, after completing his formal education in 1817 and securing a licence to practice, and I quote, the art and science of surgery from London's Royal College of Surgeons. Now, few new medical practitioners were able to establish themselves so easily in private practice. Most first needed to acquire sufficient capital to do so. And so many sought posts as naval, military or civilian medical officers in Britain's expanding sphere of colonial endeavour. Others tried to gain work as surgeons aboard whaling ships and other merchant vessels. Interestingly, quite a number of shipboard surgeons who, on the completion of their service at sea, uh, settled in the Australian colonies, and among these men, there were many who invested what they earned by medical work in pastoral ventures or new commercial enterprises in the Australian colonies. Now, as it turned out, 
Walkley's practice did not provide him with that income that he hoped it would. And in 1823, he turned to medical journalism and he established a weekly medical journal, which was modelled on a successful journal in New England in the United States, the New England Journal of Medicine and Surgery, which had been published in Boston, the capital of Massachusetts, since 1812 by the American physician Walter Channing. Walkley called his journal The Lancet. He declared in its first issue that this name had been chosen not only because a lancet was used to cut away or drain infected flesh, but also because it was the name traditionally given to windows that let in light. Now, The Lancet was a great success. It was a success because it appealed to the many young, lower middle class men who were either medical students at that time or had recently begun practicing medicine. It appeared weekly and it offered substantial extracts of lectures by leading London surgeons that students and new practitioners would have to have paid uh, several months worth of fees to attend. Now, at first, Walkley published these extracts without gaining the lecturer's permission. He personally attended lectures or he employed someone else to be there and take down what was said in shorthand. Some medical lecturers were agreeable to Walkley publishing parts of their lectures. They saw that it was good publicity. Uh, they could make money out of this by attracting more students. And it was uh, certified evidence of their at their lectures, rather than what was learned by attending the lectures, that enabled entry and thereafter advancement within the medical profession. But there were some who objected, nonetheless. One who objected was a leading London surgeon, John Abernathy. And Abernathy sued Walkley. Walkley argued in his defence that the lectures were public discourses delivered for the public good in a public place. And on those grounds, he eventually won the case. Thereafter, as the popularity of the Lancet grew, leading medical teachers saw the benefits to be gained by having their lectures published. But what also contributed to the journal's success was Walkley's energetic campaigning for medical reform. Now, while articles in The Lancet need to be read mindful of Walkley's political radicalism, the pages of early issues of the journal provide many insights into the changes that occurred in the practice of medicine and traditionally the practice of medicine had been regulated by the Royal Colleges of Physicians in major English, Scottish and Irish centres. The oldest, as I mentioned last week, was London's College of Physicians, and it was established in the early 16th century. Most of the others were founded in the 17th century. But in each case, these colleges were established so that they could decide who was qualified to practice medicine and they could also direct the prosecution of unlicensed practitioners or those whom, in the words of the Royal Charter, granted London's College of Physicians, as I mentioned in our last lecture, uh, were judged to be acting, and I quote, more for the sake of their avarice than from the assurance of any good conscience, whereby many inconveniences may ensue to the rude and credulous populace. Now, to become a licentiate of one of the colleges, one generally had to be of a social background, providing enough wealth. If they were then to make a living by practicing medicine, students 
had to achieve a reputation for expertise amongst those in society who could afford to pay for treatment. Though there were many physicians who saw attending to the ills of the poor to be a charitable duty. And one well-known physician who did so was Richard Napier, who lived between 1559 and 1634. And he practised for over 40 years in the southern English uh, county sorry, of Buckinghamshire. Now, even though the focus in this lecture is on Walkley and the early 19th century, it's worth saying a little bit more about Richard Napier and his background and his practice of medicine 